what we're trying to work out right now, what everybody's trying to work out right now, is are these high prices transitory? Not only in, in food and energy, your speciality is obviously uh, in the food and energy space. Uh, what are you seeing right now? What, what is happening at the moment? And is this going to be transitory? Hey, Guy and Alex, good morning and good morning, everybody. I, we, I think it is going to be transitory. Now, you know, this, this is the dialogue, not just in, in all products, but particularly in ag and food. And as Alex had alluded to, there are issues in the supply chain, everything from later labor shortages to the impacts of climate change, extreme weather events, a demand pull for biofuels. So there's a lot of pressure on the supply chain for ag and food. But I think what I've been really struck by in the last 18 months since the beginning of COVID is the resilience of the supply chain, the ability of farmers to figure out how to get their products to market mm -hmm. and for all players to figure out how to get food to where it's needed the most. So I'm optimistic uh, that supply chain issues will clear up over time. Yeah, and you know, from when Guy was pointing out um, the inventory numbers for natural gas, Dave, part of that is also still going to be the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. If the export terminals aren't there, it's going to be hard to export it, therefore it goes into storage. That also speaks to something that you're dealing with. Um, Reserve in Louisiana hasn't been able to restart because of the storm and I, as of now. And I wondered if you could give us an update, uh, any kind of timeline for that, because that's causing some of those short-term distortions. Well, it really is, Alex, and it couldn't come at a worse time, obviously, at the beginning of uh, the North American, the U.S. harvest, and needing to get products from the farm down the river to the port and out for export. We had two facilities that were hit very hard, Reserve, Louisiana, and also West Wego. We've got West Wego up and running again. Our employees have been so resilient. There is a local town where many of our employees live, La Place, Louisiana, and so we've really been focusing on helping them get back on their feet. In many cases, their houses were either destroyed or severely damaged, so I've been very impressed to see how quickly we've been able to get West Wego up and running, but as far as reserve goes, it, it's still to be determined. We've had a lot of help, and it is amazing to see in all supply chains, but in that area in particular, Everybody's pulling together to get things back up and running, but reserve is uh, yet to be opened yet. Dave, it's an interesting point and a wider one. Um, we're all now turning our eyes towards the COP26 meeting in, in Glasgow. Um, the environment is becoming a greater focus for, for so many industries, including yours. Are you having, are you thinking about hardening kind of what you do in terms of the facilities that you have, building in extra redundancy, just toughening up in terms of your ability to sustain more diverse weather conditions? And how do you think this is going to affect the agricultural sector? We are seeing significantly more volatility. What does that mean for your customers? What does that mean for the wider industry? Well, for sure, Guy, the, the resilience and uh, diversity of the supply chain is really important. And climate change is having and going to continue to have a big impact on the growth of agricultural products, not just the growth, the production of them, but also how they get transported. I think it's one of the benefits of having a large, uh, large global agricultural company like ourselves. We have the diversity of supply chains. In other words, in terms of export, we can, we're, we're able to export from either South America or North America. And so there will be a, a reduction in exports coming out of the U.S. because of Hurricane Ida. But I think the point is you have to build resilient supply chains that are diverse in terms of where the port facilities are located or where you're sourcing your product, which geography might be Australia for wheat. It might be the Russian region for wheat as well, South America, North America for so soy and corn. Mm -hmm. But I, I think one of the benefits of having a large, diverse company is the ability to shift supply chains when necessary. And we've really seen that in the last 18 months. Um, one more quick question uh, on reserve. What's the holdup in getting it back to operational, le uh, operational level? And in the meantime, what are you doing with all the stuff, all the shipments that need to go there? Well, it's, the holdup is, is, I saw some pictures, it, the pictures were devastating. Uh, just the damage that was done to the facility, as I mentioned, more importantly, our employees and where they lived and the damage to their communities. So whether they couldn't get to work or we just wanted to focus on, on taking care of them first. And so it's just a logistical issue, which is we had 85 barges that were scattered throughout that region, throughout the river. Wow. Uh, that had previously been lined up for shipping. So it's a matter of 
And as I said, we've had s several uh, friends, Living Lands and Waters, for example, is one nonprofit that we work very closely with, and they've lent their crews, they've lent a hand in order to help us retrieve the barges. So I think it's only been about two and a half weeks, but certainly there's an urgency both on the, you know, uh, on the people, but also on the logistics and just retrieving the barges to get them uh, to get them to be able to move. As to, to your second question, Alex, that means everything backs up. It means whether maybe they have to stay in the field, maybe the crops have to stay in storage longer, but it just reverses everything up the Mississippi River while waiting for things to clear right through that bottleneck known as the, the, the Mississippi River Gulf down in New Orleans where they were hit by Hurricane Ida. It's, it's obviously going to be something that we're going to watch very carefully. The food supply chains around the world uh, are being stressed like never before, Dave. L let's talk a little bit about what you said a few moments ago as well about kind of needing to be bigger, needing to be diverse, needing to uh, have a global footprint. We've got the Cargill, Continental Grain, Sanderson Farms tie up uh, as a prospect. Y you're already big in beef, you're moving into poultry. I'm wondering if you can update us on what kind of progress you're seeing there. And I'm also, I would be interested to get some comments from you on a, a problem that we're experiencing here in the UK and sort of across Europe, which is that we are seeing high energy prices leading to fertilizer plants being shut down, leading to CO2 um, shortages, which is hitting the poultry industry really hard. Uh, it's hitting the meat industry really hard more broadly. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm curious to get your reaction to that and whether or not that's something that we could, we could potentially experience elsewhere, for instance, in the United States. Well, I'll start with the poultry uh, between Sanderson Farms and Wayne Farms and Cargill. We're in the poultry business, and we have been for a long time, just not in the U.S. So we, with our partner Wayne Farms, felt that this was an opportunity to fill a consumer demand. Our customers and also consumers, they want to eat more chicken, and they want to consume different kinds of, of animal-based protein in addition to beef and fish. So this was an opportunity for us to take the expertise that both Wayne and Cargill have in our global poultry operations to come together to purchase Sanderson Farms. So we expect that will close sometime in 2022. To the second part of your question, Guy, the, the, I think people have a new appreciation, or I should say consumers, I hope, have a new appreciation for the complexity of our supply chains meaning the complexity of ag and food, and rather than just go in a grocery store and think, okay, I'm gonna buy this, and all the choices, particularly in developed economies that people have, that there are thousands and millions of people that work to get the crops out of the field and down to the ports, and then to a point where it's, they're either put into production for some type of product, but it, that all very closely linked. So shortages of CO2, which also can come from different types of manufacturing plants, it, they all connect. Mm -hmm. The fact is, uh, the one point that you, that you didn't add to that list, Guy, or what you're seeing in Europe, is, is the labor shortages. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, we have a turkey facility in uh, Virginia that we're only able to run at 70% of capacity because of labor wow. shortages. So we've increased wages, we've offered sign-on bonuses, we've offered enhanced 401k benefits, on-site health care, daycare. But the fact is, we're still short of labor. And so I think that is something that we really have to watch carefully as it relates to long-term inflation, but also capacity utilization, mm -hmm. which there is a shortage of today because of, because of labor shortages. Hey, Dave, um, before we let you go, uh, Bloomberg reported that you guys had about almost $5 billion net income uh, for the fiscal year of 2021. You stopped disclosing all that stuff publicly. Uh, but I need some perspective on that because you are such a powerhouse in uh, ag trading. Um, also, you have the metals trading business. You have your fingers in so many different pots. And the volatility that we've seen has got to have been a huge boon for you guys. Can you give me some perspective as to how good you're doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we have a fiscal year that ends May 31st, and as you know well, Alex and Guy, there was a lot of volatility in ag markets. There was significant pull from China who were buying corn and soybeans. There was weather concerns, especially in the spring of this calendar year, uh, where we had, you know, concerns about hot, dry weather, which ended up, you know, getting better. So they're not going to be huge crops but better than people had feared in the spring of this calendar year. 
But when there's volatility, it means there's opportunities to help our customers manage their risk, help them man to uh, hedge their positions. And when you have a trading component to your business, which we do, which helps us manage our risk for ourselves, but also for our customers, there are trading benefits in involved with that. We do have a, a, a very um, successful metals trading business, and, and there has been, again, as you know, in the steel business and metals, there has been a lot of price volatility. So when companies have a trading component to their portfolio, volatility means risk management, it means hedging opportunities, and that was a component of our fiscal year results that you referred to. Bro, at a record? Uh, I don't I don't know if what, that's what the article said, but I'd have to go back and read it. <laughs> okay.